Hello, and welcome to the Still Garden Guide. My name's Jane Moore, and I'm a professional gardener, but I'm welcoming you back into my own garden to give you a few hints, tips, and ideas on how to make your garden sparkle this winter. The great thing about gardening in the winter is it gives you a good opportunity to catch up on all those jobs that you haven't quite got round to in the spring and the summer. It also gives you a good chance to stand back and take a good long look at your whole garden. What bits are working? What bits aren't? What's boring? And what can I do about it? Even in February, you can have quite a few winter stars really shining out. And my formula for a good winter garden is only three plants. The great thing about a small garden is it doesn't take many plants to make it really sparkle through any season. This one is one of my best winter plants and it's by far the biggest and the boldest. This is Cornus alba sibirica or western bird. Same plant, two different names. It has these fabulous red stems and these stems get more and more scarlet as the winter goes on and the weather gets colder. So here in February, they are as scarlet as can be. My next plant is a little bit on the smaller side. This is Helleborus orientalis. They come in the most fantastic colours from speckledy whites to pinks and these lovely dark burgundies, which I think are probably my favourites. Don't be worried about it's looking a little bit wilted. It's got the frost on it at the moment and these plants flop during the frost. But as soon as the frost comes out, they perk straight back up again and they're as tough and hardy as anything. I should have de-leafed these hellebores ages ago, but I've been waiting to show you. Believe it or not, these are the same plant. I know, they look quite different, don't they, with their leaves on? But you can see why I de-leafed them. Look at them, they get really old and tired looking and spotted and holy. So by cutting them off, I'm going to make way for the new fresh green leaves to come shining through as the season wears on. Why I should have done it a while ago is a month ago, these flowers would have been just tiny little buds coming through and it would have been so much easier to chop the leaves off then. Now, I'm so in danger of cutting the flowers off with the leaves. But hey, I wanted to show you, so wish me luck. The flowers look way more spectacular without their leaves, don't you think? Now I'm going to show you my third winter superstar. It's so easy to overlook the humble snowdrop, but it's such an easy plant to grow and so very welcome at this time of the year. There are galanthophiles that will collect all sorts of shapes and sizes of snowdrop, all sorts of different varieties, but I'm not one of them. I like just a couple of varieties and that gives me a really good long season of flowering. This is the one you'll know. This is uh, Galanthus nivalis. Nivalis means of the snow. And this little beauty pops up in woodlands and all sorts of places around and about, just self-seeding itself naturally. And it's a little star of the countryside and of our gardens too. This one will start flowering around about the end of January and will flower pretty much all the way through February, giving you a real, real little shine in the garden. Before that, this one is almost going over. This is Galanthus elwesii, and it's almost finished. But look, you can see it's just a slightly bigger cousin. The flowers are a bit bigger, the foliage is a bit bigger. It's a bit taller, generally. And elwesii, I often think of it as a kind of New Year flower. I have known it flower on the 1st of January. It's often a little bit later than that, but it will flower all the way through January, giving up as Nivalis gets going. So with these two varieties, I get two full months of flower just when I need it most, right in the depths of winter. 
And February is kind of that month where I tend to think I need more snowdrops. The great thing about snowdrops is that they clump up so wonderfully if they're happy and they'll kind of move themselves around the garden, seeding themselves into odd little corners and popping up in all sorts of places. But you can really help that along and that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Um, I've lifted this clump of Elwesiae's because they're just starting to go over and I'm gonna pop them into this top border of mine. Bottom of my garden is awash with snowdrops, but this top border is sadly bereft. So I'm intending to amend that situation. These are so easy to plant in the green. You can plant them at any time when they're in active growth. That's in the green. Um, but I'm planting these as they're just going over really. So I've enjoyed the flowers elsewhere and now I'm gonna spread them around and hopefully they will do well up here. I just lifted them with a border fork and I'm just going to take out a few holes in anticipation of planting them and then I will gently tease apart this clump and what I'll do is I'm hoping to get maybe three or even four clumps out of this you really you can almost plant the bulbs singly if you want to uh, but I don't really want to do that I'm going to plant them as a bigger group so I'm just going to tease them apart I'm saying gently but you've got to be a little bit manhandling about them get the bulbs into these smaller sort of groups like that and that's perfect for planting the most important thing to remember when you're planting them in the holes is to make sure that they go in at the same depth that they came out of you can see pretty much where the soil came up to and that is the crucial thing to do and after I've got them in I will just give them a bit of a firm and probably settle them in with a drop of water as well especially as it's a sunny day so when I've got this little job done I I'm going to treat myself to a cup of tea and a spot of preparation for my next big job. My next job is pruning the wisteria and for that you need a good sharp pair of secateurs. I've got this great little tool here. This is a three-in-one sharpening tool and it is just the business for putting a very quick cutting edge on the blades. You just simply draw it through a couple of times and that will just give it a nice little edge to cut with. This great little tool is brilliant because you can use it for your cuttings knife, for your secateurs, even things like shears and uh, putting an edge on an axe as well. It won't take the place of a good strip down and proper service every now and then, but nonetheless, when you're on the go, it's just the business. Pruning wisteria is one of those depths of the winter jobs. It's a real rite of winter passage that I really love partly because it makes me think of spring. I think of the wisteria in full flower, all scented and glorious at the end of April, beginning of May, and it just makes me think, oh, it's on its way, it's on its way. There is something about pruning wisteria that seems to really flummox gardeners, and I think I know why. It's because wisteria grows at such a wild rate, you get a bit overwhelmed by it. But um, really, it, the trick is to keep it quite simple. Wisteria needs pruning twice a year. Ideally, once in July, August, when you prune off all the sort of stragglers, things like this, and once in the depths of the winter. Now, you may have noticed that I have not pruned off all my stragglers because I couldn't see them. There was too much foliage going on for me to notice all of this stuff going on behind. 
So really, the important pruning time is actually now when you can see exactly what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by taking off all of these stragglers and I'm just going to snip them off as hard as I can right back to the base. Once you've got all these stragglers out of the way, it's kind of a bit more contained and then you can focus on pruning for flowers and really that means taking things like this back to a few buds. The crucial thing to remember is that wisteria grows like mad, grows like a rocket. So actually, if you prune it a bit hard, it's not going to do any harm whatsoever because the thing will grow again. Good pruning though does mean that you should get really, really good flowers, I hope. And mine does usually perform really well, so I must be doing something right. Of course, you don't always get these lovely sunny days in the winter, do you? And I have picked my moment for pruning the wisteria. But I have got another little job to show you that perhaps might be a more a good job for a less than clement winter day. Well, I promised you a nice cosy indoor job and this is one of my favourite winter jobs, partly because it also has the promise of spring about it. This is my potatoes that I'm going to grow this year and I'm going to set them to chit. Chitting is really just where you get them growing, where you get them growing a little bit and you only need to do it with first earlies and second earlies because they come out of the ground so early. With main crop potatoes, you don't need to do it because you don't harvest them until July or August. They've got plenty of time to grow. But with the first earlies and the second earlies, you're hoping to get that really nice early crop of new potatoes. And so actually you want to just get them started. And that's all chitting actually is. It's just where you let them grow like an inch or um, a centimetre or two centimetres before you actually put them in the ground just to give them that head start. And chitting is actually really easy and really straightforward. All the potatoes have eyes on them. Gosh, there's a lot of terminology about potatoes, isn't there? But all potatoes have these eyes and these are basically dormant buds. And what you want to do is stimulate them into growing so that they can just go into the ground already going strong. I've got two varieties here, two of my absolute favourites. This is Charlotte. Uh, really lovely uh, salad potato or boiled potato and it's a second early and this is a first early which means it will come out of the ground first this is red duke of york uh, another one of my favorites actually a little red potato um, and all you're going to do is set these with the rose end another bit of terminology upwards in a seed tray or an egg box or something like that anything to just hold them upright but the rose end is the end with the most eyes or buds on it. And you're going to set them in your seed tray with the rose end upwards. Sometimes it's not always that easy to identify which is the rose end, but you just have to kind of hope for the best and uh, hope your spotting skills for dormant eyes are what you want them to be. And you're just going to set them with the rose end upwards and put them somewhere light and bright, either a sort of windowsill or a porch or just on the dining room table or something like that, um, so that those eyes start growing. And before you know it, you'll be putting them in the ground, probably sometime in around about March, and hopefully harvesting them in June or maybe even May. So then I'm just going to pop them on the on a light windowsill. Well that's that little job done and the promise of spring to come. 
Thanks for joining me. I hope it's given you a few ideas, hints and tips for your garden this winter. I look forward to seeing you next time.